It truly is your show, as you may ask anything medical, and we'll do our best to answer your questions tonight on Call with the Prairie Doc. Good evening and welcome to On Call with the Prairie Doc. Dr. Holm is off tonight. I'm your host for this evening, Dr. Deb Johnston of Avera Medical Group, Brookings. From athlete's foot to frostbite to Zika, we are here to answer whatever health question you have. But first, let's take a look at this week's Prairie Doc quiz question. An 85-year-old man with an advanced directive, a living will, that directs do not resuscitate, comes into the ER with chest pain and while there has a sudden cardiac arrest. The doctor and the family know about his DNR wishes, but the family in the room tells the doctor to start resuscitation. What is the safest and least litigious action the ER doctor can do? Resuscitate or do not resuscitate? Viewers who call in the correct answer will be entered into a drawing to win a signed copy of our book, The Picture of Health. Each of Dr. Holmes' essays, originally written for this show, comes with a wonderful accompanying photograph by Dr. Judith Peterson. We will announce the answer and the winner at the end of the show. You have 10 minutes to submit your answer. We address your medical questions as they are called in or sent to us via Facebook or email. Call in questions to 1-888-376-6225 or send an email to the address on the screen. Joining us tonight is Dr. Aaron Burkhart of Avera Medical Group Internal Medicine in Sioux Falls. Welcome and thank you for joining us in the studio tonight. My pleasure. So, explain to our viewers what um, internal medicine is and how is that different from general practice or family medicine? So internal medicine is a very diverse specialty. We deal with primarily uh, diabetes, hypertension, COPD, and heart failure management, but we also address a wide array, wide array of, con of medical conditions. Basically, if a problem starts to get complex, we're usually the next ones up. Um, you know, I always think of you guys as us for adults. Yep. yep. Um, I, we in family medicine see all comers. We see pregnant people. We see newborns. We see uh, teenagers. We see adults. We see the elderly. And when we have situations that we don't know quite what to do with, it's really common for me to be down the hallway in the office of one of my internal medicine colleagues saying, Help me out here. What's what's my next step? What are the thoughts? You guys are kind of the detectives of the medicine world. Yep, and that's that's part of our thing. We we get a lot of training in the different specialties, uh, a lot of time in the ICU. So a lot of yep. times we're also called in for the hospitalist stuff and yep. taking care of acute. Uh, acute conditions as well. And uh, internal medicine is a jumping off point for a lot of specialties too. Rheumatology, gastroenterology, cardiology, pulmonary medicine. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting a whole bunch of them. So you guys are kind of the, 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 the genesis for that for a lot of people. So yep. yeah. And where you, we usually have pretty good relationships with all of our subspecialists and uh, having spent a lot of time with them, usually once once we get past first, second line, we're kind of usually calling in our friends from yep. the different subspecialties. Yep. Handy to have those people. It is very with. handy. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I love about primary care is just that ability to build that long-term ongoing relationship. So uh, I know that's probably very much the same for you folks in internal medicine. You have people from their 20s, to their hundreds, though that's a long time to get a chance to get to know somebody and their family. And it is. It's and, very nice, and that was one of the reasons I chose the internal medicine yep. group at Avera. We uh, have an emphasis on in and out patient. Uh, we keep our own patients in the hospital, which is oh, very okay. nice. And so uh, sometimes, if a patient is looking maybe a little bit iffy, we can say hey, I'm gonna be on in the hospital in the next couple of days. So if you need to come back, we're more than willing to take you here. So we can try them, try to 
negotiate an mm -hmm. outpatient course and if worst case scenario they have to come in they at least see a friendly familiar face, face. yep that's that is definitely a rare thing in in today's world it so is. yeah so um I know that you are actually an osteopathic physician uh, as opposed to a medical doctor, um, so a doctor of osteopathy. So can you explain for our viewers a little bit about the difference between osteopathic and allopathic medicine? Definitely. So um, the first osteopathic physician actually was an MD. Um, he just believed that there was also a few principles that were being missed in the medical education at that time. As time has gone on, the two have blended together so much that they're basically the same thing. Uh, but we kind of learn things in a very, in a little bit of a different manner. Uh, osteopathic physicians are taught four main principles, but the one that I feel is most important is mind, body, and spirit. As long as those three things are in alignment, you have health. Most people view just the body as a corporeal entity. And it's actually composed of so much more. If you're not mentally well, physically well, and spiritually well, you're not going to be feeling healthy. Mm -hmm. Something's going to be off. And my job as a physician is not to cure you, it's to help your body cure you. And which is, I think, a very good way to look at it. I've had a lot of colleagues who learned in a very in the MD pathway and they sometimes feel that if something didn't go well that it's that it was their their mistake sometimes a disease course is too far along um, or a patient doesn't have the willpower to keep going and sometimes it just takes that one little thing figuring out that missing piece of the spiritual, the connection with their family, or, you know, I have this son I've been fighting with, and mm -hmm. getting that relationship mended sometimes allows you to turn that corner, or uh, a pet missing from home. <laughs> uh, I think, um, you know, there's increasing attention and interest and awareness of that mind-body connection too, and uh, particularly uh, trauma trauma histories and how uh, that childhood experience of, of what they call adverse childhood events, uh, divorces, poverty, um, loss of a home, home uh, loss of a family member, um, abuse. Abuse is obviously a huge one and what an important role that pays, plays in health going forward even at a point when you would expect people to be long past that. I have um, an abundance of patients who are uh, elderly, they're in their 80s and older, who sometimes will start talking about the horrible things they went through when they were children, about their alcoholic parents or um, their abusive father or um, getting kicked out of the home when they were way too young. And uh, I think that's something that we don't always pay enough attention to. Definitely, and I always have said that the, the most important part of the medical experience is actually spending time talking with the patient. Sometimes it takes a while to get these, these things to come to light. Um, Absolutely. I've had, I had one patient who I spent an hour and a half talking with just trying to figure out why we were constantly getting exacerbations of underlying medical conditions, found out she was being abused at home. And it took almost the entire hour and a half to figure that out. It, it takes a long time for people, and this is part of, I think, why primary care is so important. It takes a long time for people to be willing to trust you it with does. that. And it's an incredible honor when they do. And we're getting some questions, so everybody, please, please, please call in with your questions because just listening to the two of us babble might be fun for us, but probably not so fun for you. So here is our first question, a woman from Sioux Falls who would like to ask about the difference between wet and dry macular degeneration and what is the treatment for both? So I... I'm not an eye doctor. Neither am this I. Is, this um, is a little bit um, 
a, a little bit outside of my wheelhouse, as, as we say. Um, so do you want to? So I would say uh, if you're concerned that you might be experiencing this condition, seeing an ophthalmologist would probably be the best uh, answer for this. Um, seeing your general practitioner, uh, family medicine, internal medicine would help probably be able to elicit the difference between the two. Wet, just, wet macular degeneration just refers to uh, fluid pressure within the eye itself. And so seeing your, seeing, your, seeing your ophthalmologist would actually be able to diagnose it properly. Uh, they would have the proper tools, and on top of that, they would be able to treat it appropriately. Yeah, you, you really need an ophthalmologist to help with, with your macular degeneration. Macular degeneration is a difficult condition because it really does uh, threaten vision, and that has a huge impact in your quality of life, and our treatments aren't that great. Yep. for macular degeneration so our, so that's not maybe the best answer we'll <laughs> we'll keep trying keep sending us your questions we'll keep trying um, a man from Highmore is experiencing pain on the balls of his feet there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with his toes um, can you talk about that and talk about podiatry so I can't really speak for my podiatry fr friends but I would say probably your going to be in need of a little bit of probably at least an x-ray to make sure you don't have something like a stress fracture. Um, some of them can be very minute, um, but uh, an x-ray would probably be the first line therapy for that just to see what we've got. You could have any number of conditions also playing into it. If you have any history of diabetes um, or if you haven't been checked for diabetes, it would be probably good to make sure that there's not a charco joint forming. Yeah. It's one of the first things that I think of when um, somebody's complaining of foot pain but everything looks normal on the foot is neuropathy, uh, nerve pain on the mm -hmm. foot. And the most um, kind of classic example of something that would cause neuropathy would be diabetes mm -hmm. uh, causing that nerve damage. And that can be an absolutely miserable Mm -hmm. experience and there are some treatments that we have if the problem is uh, a medical problem then there's some medications that can help with that nerve pain um, if it's an arthritic condition there can be some medications that can be helpful for that uh, our podiatry friends have some additional treatments that they can offer for joint, injection. joint injections and um, certain kind of physical modalities to help with that uh, nerve pain and uh, sometimes the issue is arthritis in those joints the foot has an incredible number of joints I mm -hmm. remember spending a lot of time in medical school trying to remember this bone and this bone and this bone and this bone and okay. Um, there's a lot of them. <laughs> as well as uh, all sorts of ligaments and tendons holding the yes. foot together. Um, it could have been something as simple as falling a asleep strain. at night in a strange position and yep. you just tweaked your foot just wrong or you stepped on an uneven surface, surface. wrong. There's start, so many things. Start with your primary doctor because um, they can help direct you is this uh, something arthritic, something structural, or is it something in the nerves? So we're, we're handy to have. And on that note, diagnosing a medical condition can sometimes be a real detective story. Often when a problem is discovered, it seems like it should have been found earlier. But the path isn't always that obvious until you arrive. I had had some chest pain and not feeling very well, ended up going to the heart hospital in Sioux Falls and was diagnosed with se severe anemia. So then saw my regular doctor's covering person and they're just like, take iron. That following summer in June and July, just felt flushed, would wake up in a sweat. And at first it's like, okay, I'm in my 50s. Ended up going to the emergency room in Brookings and very nice uh, ER doctor said, you're having a panic attack. And about two weeks later, happened again, worse. So husband took me back into the emergency room and they're like, took some x-rays and he's like, well, I think I see something in the x-ray on your stomach, but you know, take Nexium, do this. Ended up seeing Dr. Cruz going in and seeing her and going, this is what's wrong with me. I am not a depressed person. I don't feel like I'm having 
panic attacks. I feel like there's something wrong in my body. And she heard me. They ended up taking stomach x-rays and they saw a problem in my stomach. And then they sent me to um, the partner of the doctor who had done my gastric bypass in 1996. And he's like, you have a fistula. When you look it up, there are a very small percentage of patients that have had gastric bypass that get these. So it is a known thing to watch for. And so it can cause all the symptoms that I was having. So it's a part of your stomach that's not being used anymore. It's reattached to the stomach that's being used. And it just reaches out like a finger or like I like to think of as an octopus. As for the stomach, uh, I had the overstitch done and then within about a year, I started having issues again and I could tell, because I was so in tune now with my body, that I had a problem again. So I let Dr. Cruz know and she goes, don't even come see me, we're gonna get you in to see Dr. Strand. Went and saw him, went in and did a scope again and he's like, you have another one. So I ended up actually having a second one done here in October. I've been able to tell other people, find a doctor who's gonna advocate for you and please advocate for yourself. You have questions or you need to follow through on something, do it. So do you have an experience in kind of tracking down a really unusual diagnosis or something that was a mystery for a while until you finally kind of came to that aha moment? So a lot of times it kind of seems more to the effect of just kind of working through the diagnosis. I'm kind of a, I like to be in the trenches. Um, a lot of times it's taking a broad picture at first and just trying to listen to the story, figure out what set of tests I would need to rule out the top few things. And as I find little things that point me towards one diagnosis, I find that that's about the better way. I like to cast a wide net first and kind of uh, wheedle myself down. So my wide net usually encompasses quite a bit of, quite a few conditions. <laughs> um, and so I can't really think of a single aha moment, but most of the time it's kind of like, it kind of comes down to me just saying, all right, these are all the things it could be. And then when you get it down to, all right, now let's look at all the information we've got and then it's, okay, it's one of these. We have a question from a patient that I think it kind of plays into it. Uh, about a two months ago, a gentleman from Winter had pain under his right shoulder blade, shoulder and the back, it went into his neck, his chest, um, and back, and different places, and then he'd get a headache all night long, and then it would go away. Uh, the doctor said it was a muscle problem, but he wasn't so sure about that because it moves on his back. Has you ever heard of anything like that? So, I mean, most common for an injury, for uh, that sort of pain would be something you would think it being so localized, the, you'd be thinking, uh, localized but moving. It almost sounds kind of like a spasm, like a muscle spasm or um, a ligament strain on one of the bones or a tendon strain from one of the intercostal muscles. However, you really need to also think gallbladder. Uh, gallbladder. Uh, Good one. In the in the osteopathic tradition of medicine, we kind of talk about somatic somatosensory pain mm -hmm. signals, and one of the, especially along the thoracic rib cage, uh, you're actually discuss, you're actually talking about a lot of the visceral organs liver, gallbladder, pancreas would all be on the right side um, for uh, tender points that you would associate with those. Um, the original McBurney's point was actually discovered by an osteopathic physician and that was in and relation that's, to the that's appendix. That's the point that we always look for pain when somebody has an appendicitis. Correct. I always tell my patients the insides of our bodies aren't very smart. Yeah. Um, you get pain in bizarre locations that are coming from those internal organs, like the person having chest pain that's having a heart attack and they have pain in their elbow or pain in their jaw. And I think people are more and more aware of that now, but it's important to recognize that um, it's not just the heart 
that does that. One of my favorites with little kids um, is the child will have ear pain, their ears hurt, and mom or dad are just convinced it's an ear infection. Their ears are fine, but it's from their tonsils, yep. pain from their tonsils that happens. So I guess my advice to this individual is, you know, it, it may be muscular, it may be something else. If this pain is persisting, mm -hmm. uh, you definitely want a good opportunity to sit down and talk with your doctor. Um, sometimes reflux will do bizarre things, and uh, it's worth sitting down, particularly with an internist, yeah. and let them kind of try to sort it out. The other thing with that is, is making sure in this in this day and age we make use of a lot of acute care because yes. it's convenient but having a primary care physician somebody you see regularly who knows you uh, when they when you come into yeah. the office they actually have talked to you on multiple occasions if you're seeing a different provider each time they're gonna think on the top over. of their list yeah it's, it's important to recognize that acute care you know what they're doing at that moment is is this something that needs to be dealt with right now? Mm -hmm. Is this, do you have strep throat, do you have an ear infection, do you have pneumonia, or are you having a heart attack? They're not necessarily going to be thinking about or doing, and it's not appropriate for them to be doing that ongoing health care and that ongoing investigation. So, um, a woman from Canova has a calcium deposit on her foot, and what can she do about it? Well, um I don't know how large this calcium deposit is. Um, or how symptomatic. How symptomatic, where, yeah. the location of it. If it's, uh, a lot of people can get them on the uh, plantar surface of their foot and that's usually like a heel spur. Yeah. And most of those are just conservative management, stretching out the tendon. Uh, uh, basically, the there's a large flat tendon on the bottom of the foot that tends to get uh, really, really tight. And when it gets tight, it pulls on that uh, the Red calcaneus bone. and so you essentially end up with a little heel spur and it's very tender not very fun and the way you fix that is you have to loosen up the tendon and one of the things I actually have used many times before is to get uh, like a Gatorade bottle throw it in the freezer and two thirds you, of the way through yep, full, so, roll, yep. roll your foot over the top of it and actually do that anytime you're sitting down um, or thinking about sitting down, do that for a few minutes every day. It's soothing because of the ice and it actually stretches out the tendon. the tendon. You can also get calcium, arthritic changes in the foot can cause calcium deposits. And I think, again, if this is something that's troublesome and bothering the individual, it would be worth going in and having somebody take a look at it. And if it's just cosmetic, I would ignore it. <laughs> um, so a woman from Sioux Falls, this is a really good one and a very timely question. A woman from Sioux Falls asks, is there anything to be done for the common cold other than over-the-counter medication? If there's no fever, is it worth seeing a physician? So it's, it's always worth seeing a physician in to make sure that there's no other warning signs. There are some things that can be missed just that we can't see personally. Um, if you have a bacterial infection in your ears, the upper respiratory system is very complex. It composes your eyes, nose, sinuses, upper airway, which is the oral cavity. Plus on top of that, your ears are a big, are a big one. You could be missing an otitis, uh, a middle ear you, infection. Usually you'll have a fair bit of pain if yeah. you have that, or you'll have decreased hearing. And you know, I think um, if there's a question, mm -hmm. get it checked out. Definitely. If you feel, ah, darn it, I've got another cold, and you're not having trouble breathing, yep. you're not exhausted, you're not, it's really common for kids to run fevers, but I don't expect adults to run fevers as easily with upper respiratory infections. So if you're running a fever, um, if there's anything that seems out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. it's worth coming in. But I, I've just got to plead with people, yeah. please come in and say, it's okay if it's just a virus, mm -hmm. because antibiotics will not help you. 
Yep. And there are risks associated with antibiotics that aren't necessary. There's allergic reactions, antibiotic resistance, Clostridium difficile infections, which is a bacterial overgrowth situation when you've had antibiotics, and that is a miserable, miserable condition. So if your doctor says, ah, I'm afraid an antibiotic's not going to help you, don't argue. <laughs> you don't want it. They're, they're, we're trying to be antibiotic stewards anymore. Uh, the reason why you're seeing a lot of these super it, bugs. these super bugs coming out that require three, four drug regimens is because of the overuse of antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of the more common antibiotics that get handed out very readily don't, don't really work. have any don't really don't have work for very serious good, infections. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. so um, a lot of times those serious infections require hospitalization because they have to be give, be given intravenously and there aren't very good uh, over the uh, oral medications, but sometimes seeing a doctor can help you if you're having a persistent cough that just uh, that just won't quit or relent. Right. Um, sometimes you might not be taking the correct over the counter, so getting a good expectorant, yeah. getting a good um, uh, secretion thinner, getting some of that knowledge can actually be a benefit, can be helpful. especially for managing really bad symptoms. And I think one of the really important things this time of year is to talk about influenza and how influenza is different from a regular old cold. So what do you, what do you tell your patients about that? What do you listen for? Well, um, I actually have the experience of having had influenza, <laughs> um, which is very different from the common cold. Uh, I've never been knocked down so hard as I was when I was uh, when I had influenza. Since that day, I've always gotten an influenza immunization. Um, it was when I was in high school. I remember laying in bed, every muscle ached when I laid down, but it hurt more to move. Swallowing was a nightmare. Um, you just feel miserable uh, from the diffuse muscle pains fevers, you don't want to eat anything because it hurts to swallow secretions. It's not that you have like strep throat-like symptoms. It's not that your throat is scratchy. It's the fact that moving the muscles to initiate a swallow just hurt. It's hard to keep hydrated with the flu. Um, it it Full-blown flu is a miserable experience. And what I always find that seems to impress patients the most is how suddenly it hits them. With a regular old cold, people usually will have a little bit of sore throat, and then they get kind of stuffy, and then they get a cough, and, and they're, they're miserable. But with influenza, people will come in. I, I just very strongly remember this one youngster who came in, and, and mom said, you know, they were absolutely fine when we left for grandma's house, and the child turned around, looked at mom, and said, I was fine when I got out of the car at grandma's house, and by the time I got inside, I thought I was going to die. It was, it was just a perfect example of, oh, you have influenza, uh, because the, it hits people like a ton of bricks. And they'll come in and they'll say, 3.30 yesterday afternoon. Um, the body aches, the headache. Uh, this is a situation where I, it's not uncommon to see an adult with a fever. Um, the cough, the respiratory and symptoms. Um, it's really important, you know, this is an, a bad flu season yep. and we're seeing people die mm -hmm. from influenza and people that we don't normally expect to die with influenza. So. It's really important if you're at higher risk for complications of influenza that you come in and touch base with your doctor and that you think about getting on an anti-influenza medication like Tamiflu, or Tamiflu is the most common one, but Relenza is also available. So um, who are you particularly concerned? So I get really concerned about patients who have other conditions that involve their lungs. Um, we deal with a lot of patients with COPD or congestive heart failure, and they're already running pretty tenuous with their breathing Status. situation. Um, especially also patients who have malignancies, cancer, leukemias, lymphomas, who are getting chemotherapy that's knocking down their immune system. Um, 
those are the people that I get really concerned with. Diabetics. Diabetics as Diabetics, well. Diabetics, people with muscular, neuromuscular diseases, uh, cerebral palsy, um, people on uh, immunomodulating therapy, med people who we give medicines to to say, yeah, your immune system's not going to work so well, mm -hmm. um, MS or rheumatoid arthritis. Yep. So any of those people who are immunosuppressed or who deal with these chronic medical yeah. conditions that are that have them in and out of the hospital frequent frequently because a lot of them are also at higher risk yes. for um, resistant bacterial, bacterial infections. Too. And the thing that is the big problem with the flu is that the body's response is overwhelming when it comes to uh, any sort of upper uh, any sort of respiratory infection because the lungs are so important to the human body and so what happens is you get this such overwhelming response it really knocks down the membranes and they're not as yeah. able to deal with even weak bacteria getting in yeah. it really damages your defenses and leaves you very susceptible to other types of infections um, another couple of groups that of course are not necessarily the people that you will be seeing, but uh, pregnant women are uh, at very high risk for complications for influenza. Uh, and the elderly, just in general, obviously, that's yep. your, your ballpark. Um, and young children, under five, but especially under two, are at higher risk for influenza. Infants we worry a lot about, and that's why we always want to get mom immunized and dad immunized and really anybody who comes into close contact with that infant uh, to the point that I know a lot of uh, female physicians who if they have a young baby won't let grandpa and grandma see the baby if grandpa and grandma haven't had their flu shots it's because you're contagious mm -hmm. with influenza for a day before you even know you're sick so um, it, it's easy to spread and do your bit get your flu shot yeah there is a reason why it's survived for so long. Yes, yes. And it's also important to recognize, like we touched about a little bit earlier, if you have influenza and you're getting better, that's wonderful. But mm -hmm. if you start getting worse again, you really need to be seen. Yep. And it doesn't matter if I saw you at 10 o'clock in the morning, if you are feeling like you're making getting significantly worse, come back in at 3. Mm -hmm. it, people get sick very quickly with this flu and they, they need to not hesitate to get checked out again. Definitely, definitely. So. All right, um, we have a man from Sioux Falls who asks, does osteopathic medicine practice a more integrated or whole body medicine compared to allopathic doctors? So there's been so much crossover uh, since I'd say the late 70s, early early 80s, as the osteopathic as osteopathic physicians have become more and more involved in the in the medical fields, that the osteopaths that are interacting with MDs during their residencies are actually starting to rub off on each other, mm -hmm. and so they do from the very beginning spend a lot of time dealing with integrated processes. Um, it's very much based on integrative principles in osteopathic medicine, and we are taught to look for the whole condition. Um, uh, I touched on this a little bit earlier about the four main principles of osteopathic medicine, the first being mind, body, and spirit, the second being structures related to function, and the third uh, big one is that the body has an innate ability to heal itself, and as physicians, we are actually helping the body. It's a great field. While the duties of a physician have changed over the years, our primary job is still to treat our patients. It's not a nine to five job and the environment is more technical every year. Two doctors shared their thoughts about their day-to-day -day role in healthcare. In an ideal world, the easiest way to change, and we're already trying to even incorporate this, I don't want anything to do with the computer in the room. I want to take care of the patient. Okay, so we've had it as far as with it where we have what's called a scribe. Had our nurse come in and she's on the computer typing all of this in and all I have to do is talk. Okay, that's what I went to school for, not type on a computer. 
the computer has done both, helped and hindered, because it's very time consuming getting all that data put in. Once it's in, it's much more concise and easy to follow along, easier to find things not coming in with these big thick paper charts that we used to have before. Um, so at least finding the things is easier. Um, but the hard part is to make sure that you're still going to treat that patient like a patient and not focus on your computer the whole time. So I make a habit of it as far as had rearrangements made in, in my uh, exam room so that when I have it on the counter and look and I'm looking at the patient along with my computer and not off to the side. So from that part of it, you just have to make sure that you keep things straight on that. I think, you know, medical, medical school, we're really students in, in medical school, so we've got that part down. But when we go into practice, we kind of put on some different hats and, and a lot of different roles, um, I would say. Um, we kind of become more and more detectives and trying to gather all the data and, um, and you know, come to, a, come to the eureka moment where we know the diagnosis. But we also, I think, are increasingly becoming pilots where we're um, kind of trying to steer everyone towards health through the uh, complex system and we rely on teams of people and and we use checklists and um, kind of guidelines and then and then but then as we get more mature we are kind of honing our craft and becoming artists and uh, that that's a part that often gets forgotten where we're um, you know, artists trying to examine the patient in a way that makes them comfortable and we're trying to relate their narrative of their uh, condition so that people understand it. And, um, and then coming and designing a treatment plan or an operation that'll serve their unique needs. I like the fact that, that no day's the same and I never know what I'm going to see, especially as a hospitalist, you get, you get a lot of different diagnoses coming in. And you never know what the patients are going to talk about or maybe what their jobs are or what their experiences are. And so, um, and then just knowing, working with a team of people that all have the same goal of getting them, uh, keeping them healthy. I am still happy. There are days as far as with it where it, it struggles because um, there's a lot of other obligations, commitments with it. But the part that's still exciting about going to practice is every single day is different. Okay, no two are the same. It can be smooth, can have some catastrophes coming in, never know what's going to roll. Um, you learn to roll with that and go, but like I said, it's, there's never a dull moment. So we had some questions while we were uh, listening to that roll in. Um, here's one from a man from Sioux Falls wondering if someone is in their 90s, is it still beneficial for them to be taking calcium supplements? So I mean, to me, uh, the best products are going to be your natural products. Um, a lot of times these supplements are very much more concentrated than your body actually needs and you end up, you end up getting rid of it one way or another. Taking a uh, glass of milk if you're able to, or getting other dairy soy products. Soy milk, calcium rich orange juice, eating your cheese, um, your oysters, tuna with, with bones, and all those kinds of things. Um, that's definitely the best way to do it, but I think yeah, I worry a lot about 90 year old people and their bones, so making sure you're getting adequate calcium and vitamin D is important. Mm -hmm. Best out of your diet. It's got to be a supplement. There it is. Yep. So, uh, a woman from Sioux Falls wants to know what can be done about chronic bursitis of the hip. Um, so, chronic bursitis is kind of a kind of a rough beast, just because it you get an injection and it goes away. Um, sometimes I've found sending them to an orthopedist and just having them take the bursa. Sometimes removing it helps. Sometimes so can be helpful. A lot of times I will refer them to ortho at that point in time just to. Physical therapy I often find can be really helpful too. They can, you know, maybe this is something you do more of as an osteopath, but physical therapy can often do some modalities and teaching them the right stretches and correcting posture, and that can be very helpful for people too. And especially if it's of like the elbow or a wrist or a supporting joint, sometimes people are 
putting that joint down on the table yep. frequently and so getting their posture changed so that they don't do that sometimes helps. A woman from Custer had a meniscal tear from work and her work comp case got closed but she's still having a lot of problems with it. What else can be done with the tear? She walks two miles a day but there are some days she cannot walk far because of that meniscal tear. Usually with these I refer them to my ortho friends. Yeah. Because I think you're doing everything appropriate for conservative management and still having issues with it. I would say probably we're talking about repair. I, I think we have two issues here. Number one is the work comp issue and the, the logistics and the legalities of that and the other is the actual knee problem. So um, my usual take for people is to say, hey, let's get you the care you need and then we'll let the insurance companies battle it out, whether that's going to reopen that work comp case or whether that's going to go mm -hmm. through your own insurance. And a lot of times, unfortunately, it does end up going through your own insurance. But getting back to your orthopod is the way to go. Oh, here's an interesting one. Um, a man from Pierre asking, how does one know if they have a sexually transmitted disease and when should they see a provider? Um, so it depends on gender. Uh, for men, usually discharge or uh, pain any with pain, urination. pain with urination, pain with um, any slight irritation of the testy, those are usually warning signs that you need to see a physician uh, for those. I think the, the take home message is if you've got the question, see the physician. Yes. <laughs> um, it, about 90% of, of gonorrhea and chlamydia cases in men are symptomatic, but mm -hmm. that leaves us 10% that aren't. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's vice versa in women. Most women don't have much at all for symptoms with gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, we may with other STIs, but not with those. And then there are things like um, hepatitis mm -hmm. and uh, HIV and syphilis. I saw my first case of syphilis ever in the last six months. And I am <coughs> embarrassed to say that I didn't even think of it until the patient asked directly about it. Um, so we're, it's out there, protect yourself, use barrier methods, uh, limit your partners, but if there's any question, come in and, and get it checked out. Um, this caller has had strep throat and the signs and symptoms are not going away. And they've been to their primary doctor and are wondering what they should be doing going forward. Ooh, for that one, it kind of comes... That's more my wheelhouse than yours. <laughs> more, more, more your wheelhouse, but uh, once we start getting past, uh, with strep throat, it's amazingly susceptible to the penicillins yeah. and the cephalosporins. And so if you're still having symptoms after a, after a few days of being on those medications or it's going into a week, we need to start thinking a little bit outside the box. Maybe consider, else. maybe consider a visit to ENT for a laryngoscope to see if maybe there's a tonsillate that's obstructing. I think the first question that I would, I would ask is what this presenting symptoms were because, you know, sometimes we'll do a strep test on a clearly viral infection uh, and the person is a carrier so their strep test is positive but that's not what's causing the symptoms in the first place so if I give you an antibiotic for strep but you don't really have strep you have a virus it's going to take Definitely. 10 to 14 to 20 days to get better anyway. So I think one of the big questions is what were the conditions under which the strep was diagnosed and what, um, how far are we into this? If this mm -hmm. is something that, it, mono is a real classic one where people are just miserable for a long time. And there's a, about a 30% connection. People who have mono will also have strep. So, uh, it's it's worth revisiting the situation, but sometimes it's a matter of patience mm -hmm. that you need. Um, here's one from Minnesota, Edgerton, Minnesota. A grandson with cystic fibrosis, wondering about current research to help treat this. So this is one I don't have a whole lot of experience with. During my residency training, we actually had a specialized 
a group of pulmonologists who handled every cystic fibrosis patient. It's such a fragile disease and it requires such intense specialty training that most of the time yeah. with cystic fibrosis, we really need our pulmonary friends yeah. to take a look at these patients. I think th that's the take home message. Cystic fibrosis patients really need to have a, a subspecialist involvement and need to have that team and uh, are definitely more fragile. They need their flu shots for sure. Definitely. So, and it, but it is definitely a different disease than it was when I was in medical school 20 years ago. The treatments are a lot more optimistic. So They are and they're actually very good and with few side effects. Yeah. Um, a woman from Aberdeen has recurrent bladder infections and is wondering how to prevent them. So the big the biggest one is uh, making sure that you're uh, going when you need to go. When your body's telling you you need to go, probably means you need to go. Um, not holding it in because when you start getting the muscles involved, especially in that area, the urethra in females is very thin and very, very short. short which leads to pretty frequent urinary tract infections. Making sure that you're avoiding. drinking a lot, uh, avoiding frequently, avoiding after intercourse. A lot of times uh, estrogen deficiency can play a big role in older women especially. Um, and pelvic floor rehabilitation, physical therapy can be extremely helpful for that too. Um, here's a good one. Uh, Caller has sleep apnea and has a CPAP. The old mask was leaking, and as a result, they switched to a new mask, but they're having the same problem. Are there solutions? Still having problems with leaking? Leaking, mask yeah. leaking. Um, this, would be, this would be a good uh, contact the respiratory people who provided the CPAP mask. There might be something going on in the nighttime while you're sleeping that is actually causing dislodgement of some of the tubing or it might be a defective batch of masks. Keep working with your supplier I think yep. is the bottom line there. Uh, and here's a very probably this individual needs us. Uh, a man from Sioux Falls has tingling in his feet and then woke up this morning and passed blood in his urine. Wondering if the two are related and what he should do. Uh, this would be probably one that I would say needs medical needs medical, medical attention evalu evaluation. Probably not related, but anytime you have gross blood in the urine, Definitely that needs, needs to, be to be checked out. There, it could be just an infection, but that is a potential for a lot of badness. So, and um, depending on on diet, yeah, it could be something. It could be diarrhea. Yeah, it could be. Uh, it could be some. Uh, food associated yep. pathogens, some of those but, can cause things like Guillain-Barre, ascending paralysis. Go, go to your doctor, definitely go to your doctor. So, and now for the winner of tonight's Prairie Doc Quiz question. An 85 year old gentleman with an advanced directive, a living will that directs do not resuscitate, comes into the ER with chest pain and while there has a sudden cardiac arrest. The doctor and the family know about his DNR wishes, but the family in the room tells the doctor to start resuscitation. What is the safest and least litigious action the ER doctor can do? Resuscitate or do not resuscitate? And the correct answer would be A, do resuscitate. That one hurts, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's really true. I think, um, you know, we, it's really important to let your family know what your wishes are and make sure that they're on board because it's very, very hard in the moment for the family to say, let it go. So, And it was Holly Rogers from Aberdeen who correctly answered the question. Thank you, Holly, for participating and a book will be in the mail to you soon. We'll be right back after this. In a world where selfies are seemingly innocent, Something lurks. And no one is spared. How goes it? It's flu season. What is a friend? 
The dictionary defines a friend as a person with whom one has a bond of mutual affection that's exclusive of sexual or family relations. The word comes from the German Freund, which in turn originates from an Indo-European root meaning to love. Still, there are many more definitions of friendship. Friends listen, care, support, open up, and then when it really counts, are loyal. It's almost like the ethics of medicine. Friends try to benefit and not harm their pals, try to do it honestly, and try to respect the other person's freedom to choose. There are a lot of great quotes about the value of friendship. One message, the author of which is unknown, said, a friend is someone who knows the song in your heart and can sing it back to you when you have forgotten the words. Charles Caleb Colton said, true friendship is like sound health. The value of it is seldom known until it be lost. Emily Dickinson professed, my friends are my estate. And of course, John Lennon saying, I get by with a little help from my friends. In this internet age with such things as Facebook and Twitter, the number of people one has friended is apparently a sign of influence and popularity. Isn't it ironic that the technology of the internet has instead isolated some people? Several studies have even indicated the internet may be a major reason why there has been a decline in the number and quality of friendships nowadays. Humans are hardwired to have friends, though. Through the ages, anthropologists tell us a troop of chimpanzees are typically limited to 50 chimps because their shared grooming as social language, they are limited by time to know a maximum of 50 other chimps. Hunter-gatherer human tribes were typically limited to the size of about 150 people because that's the maximum number of friends one can get to know when limited by human verbal skills. The challenge of true friendship requires listening, unselfish giving, honesty, and the provision of freedom of choice by both parties. The health advantages of friendship are enormous. Solid scientific studies find those with strong friendships have better mental and physical health, increased longevity, and a deeper sense of happiness. The opposite is also true. Those friendless have an increased risk for heart disease, infections, and cancer. Of course, these illnesses come to people with friends too, but Survival is longer and easier for those who are connected. It is so true that in this tough and tumble world, we get by with a little help from our friends. No, I get by with a little help from my friends. Mm, I get high. We have one more that I think is a, a important question for us to address here today. Uh, a woman from Sioux Falls has leg pain that has caused swelling and the pain is radiating to her hip. And she's wondering about a chiropractor. So I would say let's go to your primary care provider first. There could be a clot in that leg, and that really ner makes me nervous. Being a DO, we do do some manipulations with the legs, which chiropractors would do, and it could actually dislodge said DVT yeah. if they're if it's in there, and that would be very concerning to me. That that was my big concern too. That maybe the pain isn't causing the swelling. The swelling is causing the pain, and blood clots are a very potentially dangerous situation. So I think it's really really important that this lady go in and and see her regular doctor. In fact, it might be worth even a trip to the emergency room, especially if there's any shortness of breath at all, or risk factors like birth control pills or recent travel or those kinds of things. Um, blood clots can be deadly, yeah. so we, we definitely don't want to, uh, to ignore that. So two people that need to go see their doctor for sure. Yeah. <laughs> blood in the urine and swollen legs. A big thank you to our guest, Dr. Aaron Burkhart of Avera Medical Group, for traveling to our studio in Jaeger Media Center at South Dakota State University. 
We sincerely appreciate your knowledge and experience. Thank you for inviting me. South Dakota had almost 350 new reported cases of influenza this last week and eight deaths for the season. 49 states have widespread flu and many deaths. Avoid close contact with people who are coughing, wash your hands often, and get a flu shot. It will help. And that does it for tonight. From all of us here on call with the Prairie Doc, until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Good and bad, bugs that bug us. Next time on call with the Prairie Doc. Major funding for On Call with the Prairie Doc has been provided by. Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call Television as it continues to open doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions, Brookings Health System, Ophthalmology Limited, American Academy of Family Physicians Foundation, and South Dakota Academy of Family Physicians, Avera Heart Hospital, Dakota Allergy and Asthma, Fishback Financial Corporation, Vance Thompson Vision, Aberdeen District Medical Society, Black Hills Medical Society, 3rd District Medical Society, Brookings, Madison, and Flandreau, Dakota Bank, Orthopedic Institute, Physicians Care Sanford Clinic Community Service Committee, and Swiftel Communications.